Boldwood presents The Recipe for Happiness Written by Jane Lovering And read by Rose Robinson The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue Yorkshire Dating Please complete all fields to help you have the best chance of finding a compatible match. Name Seren James Age 32 Height 1.7 metres Body type Select one from box above. Medium Status Select one from box above. Divorced. Living alone. Hobbies slash interests. Tell us a bit about you. I work as a cook at a daycare centre for senior citizens and also as a housekeeper for the site, so I live above the job. And I'm looking for a friend slash relationship with a man. Three months later. From YorkshireDating at Toodaloo.com to Seren James at YoYoBoy.com Hi Seren, we know that you've been a member for three months now and not had a single match from your chosen partner group. We've had a look through your profile and think you'd probably have a little more success if you put in a bit more about you. We've deleted, as requested, those less than satisfactory approaches. Sorry about those. There's always a few and it's very hard to weed them out. But in order for you to find your perfect match, we think you should consider filling in a few of your hobbies and interests. The things you do on a Saturday, the places you like to go, how you spend your spare time, that kind of thing. Basically, make yourself sound a bit more interesting and we are sure that the dates will just flood in. If you haven't matched with one person before the 1st of August, we will terminate your membership. Yours, Richard, Sue, Bev and Amanda. The team behind Yorkshire Dating. I held my phone up to Gregor, who had inadvisably and somewhat drunkenly asked about my love life. He and my brother Andrew had been the ones who'd got me signed up to Yorkshire Dating. Glowing with the success of their own relationship, which had now reached married status, They'd seen fit to decide that a single girl in possession of hair, teeth and half a brain must be in want of a boyfriend. They were wrong. I mean, obviously not in the hair, teeth and brain department. I definitely got all those. But wanting a partner? Not so much. The dating agency is throwing me out. Even they can't find me anyone. Apart from those men who've sent me unsolicited pictures of what I have to assume were their willies. The pictures are usually so shaky-handed and out of focus that it's sometimes hard to know whether they photographed their genitals or their lunch. I waggled the screen in front of Gregor as the wedding after-party continued around us at full volume. But they are right. He swayed a bit. Those cocktails were potent and probably responsible for my oversharing. You must tell them all about you. Otherwise, they cannot see the full glory that is Seren. Gregor drained another glass of very pink alcohol. I'd steered clear of the punch because the stuff looked like it might glow in the dark. Andrew, you come tell your sister she must put all about her life. Andrew loomed over the back of the sofa. He's right, Saren, love, he said, holding aloft a glass of something that looked as though it should register on the Geiger scale. You need to fill the form in properly. Greg, come over here. I've been telling Ernst about your latest design. I went to stand in the hallway. Around me, music played and couples danced. Andrew anxiously hovered to prevent food getting mashed into the carpet and nobody bothered about me and my email. It was the first time I'd ever been nagged by a commercial company. Make yourself sound a bit more interesting. Huh. I was interesting. I'd just been having a down day when I'd filled in that form, and having Andrew and Gregor hanging over me, peering at everything I wrote, 
had been decidedly off-putting, especially when I'd put medium in the build slash body type box, and Andrew had sucked his teeth and made wobbly head motions. But then he was my brother, so winding me up was practically his hobby. There were loads of things I could have put in the hobbies box. There was, well, I quite liked walking. Outside, place to place. Looking at views rather than just perambulating up and down a corridor, obviously. Yes, walking. And books? I liked books, some of them, when I got time to read, which wasn't often, now I came to think of it. I didn't have time for much walking either, except round the kitchen. To be honest, my job left me so little time for hobbies that I didn't see how I was going to manage to fit a boyfriend in either. I narrowed my eyes at Andrew and Gregor, laughing, arms draped over one another's shoulders. I was fine as I was. My lack of anything approaching a life didn't bother me. Odile, one of Greg's co-workers at the design agency, flopped against the wall next to me and fanned herself. Phew, hot in here. Mmm. You don't look like you're enjoying yourself much, Saren. What's up? Your brother's finally married. We can stop with all the planning and the lists and the stuff about the flowers and the cake. Pressure's off. Let's party. Mmm. Odile shrugged and whirled away off into the throng again. The high-ceilinged room was full of the smell of the very expensive floral arrangements. It was like being hit around the nose by a perfume manufacturer, and the white walls, dotted with choice pieces of artwork, led to the impression that I was existing inside an advertisement. Everyone seemed happy. Everyone was drinking and chatting and dancing except me. Me and my email, telling me that I was such a loser that even a paid-for dating site was willing to drop me. I was probably dragging their statistics down. Hobbies and interests? Who had time for hobbies and interests? Surely everyone got up, went to work, and then came home to collapse onto a sofa and stare bleakly into space until it was time for bed didn't they? I looked around me at the shrieking throng. This was the unfortunate thing. Well, unfortunate for me, anyway. All Andrew and Gregor's friends looked like the kind of people who went to see Orson Welles retrospectives at weekends, who wandered around art galleries and picked up choice pieces from up-and-coming new artists for their homes, who were taking classes in blacksmithing or burlesque dancing or, I don't know, rare frog breeding. In short, they all looked like people who had lives. Rich, fulfilling, activity-filled lives. And in consequence, not one of them looked short of a partner. But then I tried to reassure myself, this is a wedding. Of course they've all brought partners. Who goes to a wedding alone? And over on the other side of the room, my reflection in a mirror that wouldn't have looked out of place at Versailles stared back at me and said, You do. Chapter One Two weeks later, once everyone had got the alcohol out of their systems and Andrew and Gregor were back from their honeymoon, ten days in Cancun, I was round at their flat again. For dinner this time, just the three of us. I have been thinking, Gregor announced. He was big and Polish, and every pronouncement sounded as though he were about to launch into an operatic aria. That we must find you a pastime. Little bit patronising, love. Andrew came in bearing something that looked home-cooked although my professional eye spotted the slightly too regular sides, which meant he'd tipped it out of the Marks and Spencer container it had come in. Saren is quite capable of finding her own hobbies, uh, if she wants any. 
he added, catching my glare. But she will be fired from her dating app. Greg, not one whit abashed, tucked his napkin into his collar and picked up his knife and fork in happy anticipation. He's adorable, Andrew always said about his husband, but a complete philistine. But since Greg always called Andrew something so totally Polish that neither of us could pick out any words, we let this go. I don't mind, honestly. It was just nice to be sitting here in their immaculate Georgian house in York, with the original window shutters and the sweeping staircase that made me feel as though I should come down it in a ball gown doing high kicks. I don't really want anyone, Greg, honestly. I have been thinking. Greg helped himself to shepherd's pie. The two of them lived the life of art gallery owners, stylish and cutting edge, but they ate like a pair of pub landlords on their day off. You need a hobby. No, I don't. Definitely one of Marx's finest, I thought, staring at the meat and potato concoction in front of me. Slightly too much potato. That would be a budgetary choice. And I wouldn't have made the gravy quite so thick. But then, I pondered, turning over my serving with a fork. I cooked for people who complained about the texture and colour of everything I made. And I think you should come along to my evenings. Gregor finished his pronouncement by ladling up a forkful of mash and smacking his lips with anticipatory relish. Oh, God, no. Andrew covered his eyes. Please, love, don't subject Seren to your group. And why not? Greg eyeballed my brother across the immaculately set table. I mean, only these two would use antique china and hallmarked silver to serve a supermarket ready meal. I quietly envied them. Oh, not for their coupledom, which seemed to consist of discussions about work, interspersed with meals of incredible homogeneity. More for their sheer reckless style, where nothing mattered enough to be kept for best. I had a whole wardrobe of clothes and a dresser of china I was keeping for best. There was dust on the handles of both. Because, well, it's... Dungeons and Dragons, isn't it? Andrew lifted appealing eyes to me across the Regency table. Seren isn't interested in playing games with your band of brothers. His certainty annoyed me. All right, he was my older brother, but he seemed to think that my life was so stereotypically single woman that he was only one step away from passing me knitting patterns and Hetty Wainthrop Investigates DVDs. I might be. I helped myself to the food. It was just nice to be able to eat something I hadn't had to cook, even if Messrs Marks and Spencer had squeezed most of the flavour out of something I could have made both sing and dance. When's your next session? Seren's absolute ultimate cottage pie. Honestly, the best thing ever. And it mostly looks after itself after the initial prep, so it's great for meals where you don't want to, or can't, be in the kitchen all day. Take some minced beef. You can use corn too, apparently. I haven't tested that, so don't quote me, but for vegetarians it's worth a shot. How much you need depends on how many you are feeding, so I won't bother with quantities. Fry it off in a saucepan with a little oil and some chopped onion, garlic, mushrooms and any other bits of veg that are lurking in the bottom of the fridge and looking a bit wrinkly and like they want using up. Once the mince is brown and looking mincy, tip the whole lot into a slow cooker. Yes, you really need a slow cooker for this one. The oven just doesn't do the job. Plus, then you can cook it overnight if you need it for lunch. Slow, gentle cooking is the real secret here. To your mince and awful veg, add a cup of red wine, a tin of chopped tomatoes, one of those stockpot things. Beef is good, or veg if you're using corn, 
or it's all that you've got in the cupboard, and a sprinkle of gravy granules. Basically, you can shove in anything that isn't too heavy on the liquid. The slow cooker doesn't allow evaporation, so if you use too much liquid, your results will be very sloppy. This doesn't really matter. You can always pour off some liquid at the end and use it as a sauce on something else later. Give it all a good stir, turn the slow cooker on to low, and leave for at least seven hours. Overnight, as I said, is good, because then it's ready for lunchtime. But if you're serving in the evening, you can leave it on all day. Slow cookers are made for this sort of thing. It won't burn the house down or use a fortune in electricity. When you need to think about assembling your cottage pie, turn off the slow cooker. Make some mash. Don't waste cheesy mash on this, just ordinary mash will do. Pour the mince into an oven-proof dish. Now is the time to drain off any excess liquid if it's a bit runny, and dollop on the mash. Do not forget to fluff the potato so you get crispy bits. Now put your dish into a hottish oven, about 200 degrees C, but to be honest, it doesn't matter too much, until the top of the potato looks brown and the mince is hot right through. Chapter 2 Custard was a bit lumpy today, Joe commented. It was Monday and I was back at work, at what we sometimes referred to as daycare, the drop-in centre for the elderly where I cooked, cleaned, helped with some basic tasks and played more Scrabble than any human should ever have to. It was not, I responded mildly. And QWERTY isn't a word, Joe. Bloody is. It's the name of a keyboard. Joe, who was 90 and would use his age to give himself an advantage in anything, shifted in his chair. I should know. I only bought one the other day. Then it's a trade name and disallowed. I hunted for the dictionary. Battered and abused and, I suspected, with several rude pages removed. We were busy today. An increasing number of what we had to call our service users were coming in the morning and staying all day now, when we'd originally been conceived of as a lunch club. More older people were moving in with family or having family move in with them. And as costs rose, many of those families now comprised two working parents and children who were at school or college all day. Fewer of the maiden aunts the widowed sisters and the housewives who would previously have provided company to the less than sprightly. So our customers were increasingly being left alone all day and choosing to come here rather than sit by themselves in home, library or coffee shop. For a monthly fee, we provided heat, company and food. And also, someone to listen to them. Behind Joe and me, the room was full of bustle. Lena and Margaret were knitting side by side, looking companionable but, in actual fact, deep into competitive grandchildren territory. John was shuffling his way down to the TV, using his frame to batter all comers out of the way. Tom and Grace, whom we had long suspected of conducting a flirtation, were sitting together on the donated sofa, sorting through a pile of also donated books. And Will was showing Jim, our newest member, around the room, with particular attention being paid to the aircraft photographs on the wall. Will really liked aeroplanes. Couple of new people to introduce today, Seren. Holly, the senior manager, who ran the charity, came into the room. Everywhere Holly went, she bustled. She could make herself look busy just walking down the street. She always seemed to have arms and legs going like pistons, as though every step she took were a matter of life and death. And she made carrying a box from one end of the room to another feel like the most important job in the world. Her husband was a small, pale man who looked as though he didn't get enough sleep, and we rarely saw him. He probably used Holly's working hours to lie very quietly in a darkened room. I've already met Jim, 
I said, putting wand down underneath the disputed QWERTY. Really wasn't worth arguing with Joe. He'd hit you around the head with the fact that he was 90 until you gave in. No, other new ones. Polly rotated, presumably in search of the newcomers, giving every centimetre of movement the same degree of importance as a lighthouse beaming its searchlight out to sea to protect mariners. Mimi and Ned, where are they? I'm over here. A muffled voice came from behind a pile of cushions being transported from the store cupboard under the stairs by a selection of arms and legs that presumably belonged to either Mimi or Ned. Oh, so you are. Holly continued to save lives at sea. And Mimi? I left her over there. The cushion pile dipped, indicating the far corner, where I could now see a lady sitting, alone. She looked to be in her early eighties, immaculately dressed, but in a circle of quiet and solitude, which was unusual in our crowded little location. Usually, newcomers would be swiftly descended upon and drained of details of housing situation and grandchildren within seconds. Lena and Margaret were like life experience vampires. Well, that narrowed it down to the cushion carrier being Ned, anyway. Ned's just joined us, Holly went on, now stooping to pick bits of lint off the carpet. Keeping these rooms clean and tidy was my job, and part of the reason I got to live in the flat upstairs. Holly could make Mrs Hinch feel as though she weren't doing a thorough enough job. He's going to be driving the pickup bus that collects some of our members from home. I had no idea why she was telling me this, as though I had no idea what the pickup bus was, and perhaps suspected that it was for more nefarious purposes. He's also going to assist with general medical needs and jobs about the place, Holly went on, then lowered her voice slightly. He's salaried. Those of us who were paid to be here occupied a slightly higher tier in the minds of our customers than the volunteers who came and went. I think they liked the fact that we were constant, and they gained comfort from knowing that familiar faces would be here, as the floating population of volunteers could change almost from day to day. Given Joe, John's shuffly processes, Lena and Margaret's grandchild obsessions, and Will's peculiarities regarding aviation, nobody could really blame them. A lot of volunteers thought the job would be sitting around chatting about the old days to people with ill-fitting dentures, when really it was like managing a school playground whose occupants were allowed to smoke and watch 18 rated films. Since Ned was still currently just a pile of upholstery, I couldn't comment. Can you go and talk to Mimi? Holly continued to act as though the carpet were a haven for filth, picking at it as if pattern personally offended her. She's very quiet and I'm worried she might be lonely. She's coming in from a cottage up on the high moor. Her people made the arrangements. Her people would be the family Mimi lived with. A surprising number of families treated us as though we were synonymous with DPD and would make arrangements for elderly relations to be picked up and taken back to their homes like parcels. I can try. I stood up. You're only going because you're losing, Joe remarked, putting dimity on my D from wand. I'll take over, the pile of cushions said, and wobbled their way to the table, while I went across the room to where Mimi sat, hands in her lap and eyes turned to the window. Hello, I said brightly. Have you been introduced to everyone? Mimi continued to sit. She wore immaculate makeup, and her hair was carefully quaffed into soft waves, as though she'd taken a good deal of care over her appearance to come here. The hands resting in her lap were twisted and misshapen with arthritis, and there was a stick propped beside her chair. It can be a bit overwhelming at first when everyone seems to know everyone else. 
but you soon get used to it. We're a very friendly lot, I continued, although Mimi did nothing but turn her head slightly away and shift her hands under her skirt. Would you like me to fetch you a magazine or a puzzle? I sounded a bit desperate now. I was fairly certain Mimi could hear, despite her resolute refusal to look at my face. Maybe she was recently bereaved and not yet ready for thrusting into the throng. Some of the families of our customers seemed to believe that the best cure for the death of a spouse was for their elderly relative to immediately get out of the house, as though death were an infectious disease. I could only try to imagine what it must be like to lose the companion of half a century and then be expected to re-enter busy society. To shrug off the death of someone so close. Parcel them up and dispose of them like a weak old bouquet. I'll fetch you a cup of tea. This was my final gambit. Normally, even with the most reticent of service users, that would bring a one smile. An acknowledgement that the British answer to everything was a good cup of tea. From Mimi, though, it brought nothing. Her pale, composed face, with its sapphire blue eyes, continued impassive. We're having music, Will declared to me as I crossed the room again in search of the teapot, which was ever-present, circling the throng like an eager dog. It says here. He tapped his stick on a wall poster that announced that the Kirkby Moorside brass band would be playing in the car park next month. Tea and cake would be served, and there would be stalls selling produce. It was another of Holly's fundraising initiatives. I had to hand it to her. She was very big on things like involving the community and integrations. But she was even bigger on making sure there was enough money to pay our wages and keep this place ticking over. Her ceaseless energy and incessant need for incentives might be incredibly wearing but it kept us financially afloat and made sure there were enough funds for big dinners and an annual trip to Fountains Abbey. She didn't speak to me either. A man I'd never seen before was suddenly at my elbow. He had the look of someone built out of fuse wire, all lean and crackling with energy. I wondered if Holly had a load of rechargeable people in her understairs cupboard with the hoover and the lawnmower. Sorry, he continued, holding out a hand. I'm Ned. I was behind the cushions earlier. Oh. I was surprised by his apparent youth. Well, youth. He was probably about the same age as me, early thirties, although his dark hair was flecked with grey and there were lines on his face that made his age impossible to guess. Welcome on board. I shook his hand. You soon get used to it. Uh, he said. Yes. He was exactly my height, so when he looked at me, we were eye to eye, and there was an expression hidden within the depths of his hazel gaze that made me wonder. Anyway, as I said, Mimi didn't speak all the way down in the bus. I picked her up at Farndale, high in the moors, he added, pointing behind him in the vague direction as though I, born and raised in North Yorkshire, might be uncertain as to their precise location. It's very remote, he finished, as though it were my fault. They still talk up there, though, I said. It's not all hand signals and whistling. Sorry? I doubt the remoteness is the cause of Mimi not speaking. I looked over again at the lady still sitting erect on the chair, head slightly averted from the noise and kerfuffle of the room. She seems lonely, I added, aware that I shouldn't describe emotions and intentions to those who didn't want to communicate them to me. Plenty of our people had grown up in a time where feelings were not talked about. Well, we can't make her socialise. She may warm up a bit when she gets more used to things. Ned gave me a grin. I'll leave you to the tea, you promised her, 
I ought to get back to Scrabble. Joe's just having thinking time. He's got a dictionary on his phone, I said. Watch him like a hawk. Another sudden grin from the surprising Ned. Thanks. I will do. I wandered into the kitchen to make more tea, and while the kettle boiled, I leaned against the lovely scrubbed pine table and stared out of the window. Maybe I could put Scrabble down as a hobby on the dating app. No, it made me sound as though I never went outside. The car park, with the minibus blocking my view of the town, gave me no inspiration. Making tea wasn't a goer either, even though it was how I spent a lot of my time when I wasn't playing Scrabble. The dishwasher thrummed into its rinse cycle behind me. What did I do with my spare time? Did I even have any spare time? This was the problem when you lived over the shop, so to speak. Even when you weren't at work, you were at work, and I'd often potter downstairs after everyone had gone home to straighten cushions and blankets, change the odd dried floral arrangement, and generally enjoy the peace of the place. Pottering wasn't a hobby either, unless you were over 70. I wanted to make myself sound go-getting and a catch for the right man, and so far, all I'd got was a knowledge of all the two-letter words in the dictionary, a winning way with fifty varieties of tea, and a cupboard full of crocheted throws. Yeah, I was a real guy magnet. As long as the guy in question was a permanently hydrated anagram fetishist with a love of blanket stitch. Which was not what I was looking for. Unfortunately, since I didn't really know what I was looking for, and doubted that Tom Hiddleston had any interest in handicrafts or word puzzles, I was floundering. Chapter 3 so, I really only had myself to blame, I thought, sitting later that week around Andrew and Gregor's table again, now stripped of its snowy linen, and instead covered in a green cloth and a large board. Gregor, dungeon master, which sounded a lot more excitingly S&M than it turned out to be, was at the head of the table. Bent close around me were seven men. They'd been introduced, but they had all blurred into single syllables like Jed and Seb, and a background wash of logoed t-shirts and tattoos. There was quite a lot of hair, too. Some beards with metal woven amongst the growth, and more flopping locks than I'd ever seen outside a cheerleader convention. Apparently, the boys, as Greg fondly referred to them, operated as a heavy metal cover band when they weren't playing Dungeons and Dragons. I wanted to take them aside and have a word about stereotyping, but they were all over six feet tall and mostly built of leather, so I didn't dare. I pulled my chair back slightly so someone could roll for damage, whatever that was. I half expected them to get down on the floor and try to batter themselves against the Victorian Bureau, but they didn't. What on earth was I doing? Your turn, Siren, Greg announced, and the entire group looked at me expectantly. Your character needs to make a decision. Go on through the enchanted wood or go into town to try to find the magician. Seven lots of hair whipped in my direction as we all bent low around the board. We shouldn't head into the wood, muttered the one who I thought was called Nate. We need the magician. But if he's not in the town, he may be in the wood, another one whispered to me. He had a name with slightly more syllables, but a t-shirt so embellished with skulls and rivets that I hadn't been concentrating when he'd been introduced. I'd been wondering how he got it through the washing machine. Just roll and see what happens, Gregor suggested. I rolled and my chaotic neutral wood nymph character was enabled to do something, which made all the men gasp and mutter various solutions to me, most of which I obediently carried out, without having the slightest idea what was going on. 
I was tired. It had been a busy day. I'd overcooked the banana bread, and there had been rumblings of dissent during afternoon tea. What I'd really wanted to do with my evening was sit up in my little flat with a magazine telling me how wonderful my life could be if I wore more makeup and went on city breaks, and then go to bed. And yet, here I was. Even though the first five minutes of play had promptly demonstrated that Dungeons and Dragons, filled to the brim with eligible men, though it might be, was not going to be my new hobby of choice. So, you going to take this up then, Seren? The generously bearded face of Seb, who'd apparently been in my war party, which should give us a level of closeness, if only I knew what a war party was, grinned at me as we shoved the board away into its corner. It's great, eh? It's a bit confusing, I said, honestly. To start with, yeah, but you soon get into it. Ulrich clapped me on the shoulder. You did good. The rest of the men nodded and asserted that, yes, apparently I had done good. It was like being approved of by the Foo Fighters. Next time, you can build your own character, Jed nodded. It's better if you do it yourself. Andrew, hovering anxiously over the table with an armful of white linen, nodded vigorously and gave me a look, which I asked him about as soon as the door had closed behind the last leather gauntlet and motorcycle boot. What was that for? I began helping him to reset the table. What? But I'd known my brother all his life, minus the first eight years before I'd been born. He was tall, blonde and tidy, and we looked as though we came from two different families. You know, that look. Andrew gave a huge sigh and sat down on the antique chair. He conspicuously checked around the room for Gregor, but he was downstairs, showing the boys out. You're letting things happen again, Saren, he said on another sigh. And don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about. We've had this conversation before. Then he stood up and began smoothing the tablecloth over the highly polished surface of the table, murmuring soothing words to it about its desecration at the hands of the gamers. Andrew tended to have control issues, which, again, made it appear we came from very different stock. I'm not, I said, but without much conviction, because he was right. But him being my elder brother meant that I had to negate everything he said, from force of habit. You want to meet someone special, but you don't do anything about making it happen. You only joined that dating site because Greg and I pushed you into it. You didn't want to come here and play that stupid game. He looked around quickly in case Greg had come into the room unheard. Andrew didn't understand his husband's desire to be surrounded by battle elves, mages and sorcerers, but he endured it. You want a hobby or some interests, but you don't want to actually go and get any. The cloth was neatened and straightened, and he put the vase of flowers back in the middle, carefully centred on its mat. I'm busy, I said and the note of defence was so loud that it pinged off the mirror. I don't have time to wonder about getting hobbies and stuff. Well then, how the hell do you think you're going to meet anyone to date then? Andrew stood back, tweaked the floral arrangement, then nodded, satisfied. Unless you're going to start on the octogenarians you work with, you need to get out. You need to put yourself about and actually do things. I know you feel all lovely and safe in that tiny flat with work downstairs, so you don't even need to go outside unless you have to. And I have to say, the lack of exercise is beginning to tell, love. You need to start Pilates or something. But safety isn't going to find you a partner, is it? Gregor could be heard now, rattling back up the stairs amid a flourish of Polish. Andrew widened his eyes at me, 
an unsaid reproach, and we dropped the subject. But I thought about it on my drive home. The winding lanes between my brother's immaculate flat in York and my place on the edge of the small town were most conducive to thoughts about the past and the future. No broad motorways, shooting at speed from one unknown destination to another, weaving in and out of others whilst flashing past slip roads and overpriced petrol signs. Just well-known, gentle, flowing, single carriageways, where I could pick my own speed and didn't have to be alert for sudden lorries or idiots in BMWs, whose indicators, apparently, hadn't worked since the car came out of the factory. Just the tall, waving summer stems of Queen Anne's lace, laying out a white background to the unfurling fingers of meadow sweet and the dots of rattle and buttercup. Andrew was right, damn him. And we had had that conversation before. After the breakup of my short-lived marriage, when I had become a virtual recluse, swearing never to have anything to do with men ever again, excepting Andrew and Gregor, of course, and exhibiting a degree of insularity that, Andrew had told me, bordered on agoraphobia. Apparently, I'd started to let life happen to me, even during my marriage. I'd allowed my ex-husband, Hugh, to direct me and to dictate our marriage. Where we went on holiday was up to Hugh. Where we shopped and what we bought were up to Hugh. I hadn't explained to Andrew that Hugh was so exceptionally self-assured and convinced that his was the right way, that trying to deviate from his path was like trying to avert an avalanche. A few muttered objections and complaints weren't going to do it. You had to have a spreadsheet and be prepared to give a presentation with slides as to why you should be allowed to do things your way. So it was easier not to. To go along with the juggernaut of Hugh's personality and pretend that he'd swept me off my feet and just carried on sweeping. I got back home, trundled up the stairs to my flat and shut the door, thankfully. The summer sun, reluctant to allow dark a piece of the action at this time of year, was skulking down behind the spire of the ancient church. From my kitchen window, as I filled the kettle, I could see the sky staining red. The spire stood like a huge middle finger to the night, backed by the scarlet clouds, and I nodded approval of its sentiment as I made myself a sandwich. Greg and Andrew were hospitable shocking cooks. Tonight's sustenance had been a bowl of crisps and some cocktail sausages, and those had been shared with the burly heavy metal boys. I was starving, and Andrew's jibe about my gaining weight could be shoved up his carefully curated collection of artwork. Just as I was about to bite into my impromptu meal, I heard a sound from downstairs. A muffled bump as though someone had walked into a chair. A hasty look out of the window showed nothing amiss. The minibus was parked in its usual spot, with no gang of youths attempting to hotwire it. Nobody was hanging around suspiciously. But then, the bump came again, and I, mindful of the reason I was given the accommodation over the shop, before I'd come here to work, the staff had managed to lock one of our clients in overnight when she'd fallen asleep in the toilet, which had been insufficiently checked at closing. I armed myself with the nearest thing to hand and tiptoed down the internal stairs to the door that led to the kitchens. There were definite noises in there. Clonks and scuffs. Someone was inside. There was nothing much worth stealing, but... And again, there was nothing much for the local kids to do, and long, warm summer evenings tended to bring out menace and boredom, like it brought out heat rash. I flung the door open, wielding my weapon, and announcing my presence in slightly muffled tones, as my heart was thumping so hard that it wouldn't let me speak clearly. What's going on? Ned who'd been in the process of upending a packet of pork scratchings to tip the last into his mouth, jumped, choked, 
and fell backwards off his stool. He landed like a load of damp washing, out of sight on the floor behind the table. I stood and stared. Seeing it was Ned had settled my heart a bit, and I now realised that the rolled-up copy of the Yorkshire Post I was carrying probably wasn't the burglar deterrent that I imagined. Eventually, his head appeared over the top of the table as he got to his feet. His dark hair was sticking out at angles, damp with sweat, and his face, when it moved within view, looked shocked. What are you doing? He pulled himself to his feet and flopped, as though exhausted, over the tabletop. Investigating strange noises. I tapped the newspaper cudgel on my hand, for all the world like a cartoon wife, about to say, and what time of night do you call this to be rolling in drunk? Except Ned wasn't drunk, and he wasn't rolling in. By the look of the equipment he'd got spread out on the floor, he was here replacing the dodgy element on the cooker. I thought you were out, he said. I came over to fix this. You've been complaining about it all week. None of these statements were anything I could deny. He was perfectly right. Part of his job would involve a degree of handyman work. Mending small items, keeping the place in good repair just as part of mine involved cleaning, tidying and replenishing the tea bags. And I had been muttering grimly to myself about the cooker element, which only heated up properly when I wiggled the knob. I had to mutter it to myself, because the phrase wiggling the knob had caused John and Will a fit of the most childish giggles and a retrospective examination of their marriages. Um, I tapped the newspaper again. Well, I'm here. I can see that, Ned said dryly. Now you know it's only me, you can go upstairs again. I won't be much longer. Then he turned his back, screwed up the pork scratchings bag with what looked to be a degree of ferocity, and flung it down with the obviously defunct cooker element, laid on a towel on the floor. Ned and I hadn't really had much to do with one another since our introduction. He seemed friendly enough when we interacted, but then we'd usually got a crowd of onlookers, even if some of them did have to look on through fairly thick spectacles. He'd been busy and I'd been busy. The summer meant that we were getting more drop-ins than usual, as people came into town to shop or just for company in the warm weather. I'm sorry. I felt bound to say. I really didn't know you were coming over. I thought it might be burglars. Ned looked ostentatiously around the large kitchen space, quite clearly devoid of any items of resaleable value. We were broken into once. For some reason, I carried on. OK, that was by a drugged-up idiot who mistook this place for a pharmacy and who was apprehended by the police staggering down the street carrying a decorative warming pan, but even so. Once. Years ago, before I'd even worked here, when the building had been used only as a lunch club for the elderly. You don't need to keep talking, Ned said his voice echoing around the cooker's insides as he bent back to his task. I know you're upstairs as a security measure. He looked at me over his shoulder. He was doubled up, half inside the big, recalcitrant stove, looking as though an absent-minded wicked witch had been called away mid-preparation. As I said, I won't be much longer. I'd been about to offer him a cup of tea, but his tone was as cold as the inside of the oven. Or was it embarrassment? Which was ridiculous, as it was I who should have been embarrassed, bursting in like an avenging angel armed with unbiblical newsprint. Without another word, I turned around and went back up my staircase, closing the door to the little flat behind me with something that felt like reluctance. 
Was I so desperate for company that I wanted to stick around and watch someone fix a cooker? Maybe, I thought, as I reclaimed my sandwich. That should be my new hobby, forcing myself into situations where I was unwanted. I'd be good at that. The hairy boys, as I had taken to thinking about them, had been polite and accepting, but clearly slightly mystified at my presence in their game, despite Greg's assurances that it would be fine. My lack of any evident talent for, or real interest in, Dungeons and Dragons had scattered over the tabletop with the crisp crumbs. No. Gaming would not be my new interest in life. Despite Gregor and Andrew's best hopes, it would not be the medium through which I gained myself a partner, a hobby, and a life. I had tried, and it was not for me. I needed another plan. Chapter 4 So, how was the dungeon? Joe asked, willfully loudly the next morning as I brought out a plate of homemade shortbread to add to the replenished teapot. He'd casually inquired about my plans for the evening yesterday, and I had, equally casually, told him that I was off to play Dungeons and Dragons. Then I'd had to explain what Dungeons and Dragons was, as Joe and half the others had never heard of it. I couldn't believe that none of Lena and Margaret's innumerable grandchildren had ever played mentioned or otherwise had an interest in gaming, and had to conclude that neither of them actually paid much attention to what their offspring talked about, contenting themselves with nodding, smiling and counting heads. Total number of grandchildren was what mattered, apparently. Their score was about equal, although Lena was slightly ahead on points, as one had just qualified as a doctor. Margaret was coming up hard on the inside, though, with the imminent birth of a great-grandchild. It was fun, I told Joe, and then sidled off before he could quiz me any further. I had the awful feeling that he thought there had been either devil worship involved, he watched far too much reactionary television, or something sexual. He'd read Fifty Shades of Grey and was quietly convinced that everyone else was at it like rabbits. Ah, Seren. Polly came in, elbows indicating that she was speed walking, whilst the rest of her body remained still. Could you pop out and help Ned? Mimi's having a bit of trouble getting out of the minibus, and you know some of these ladies aren't keen on men, well, handling them. Grateful not to have to go into detail about last night's gaming session, I went out into the car park, where the day hit me in a burst of clammy light. Mimi was hesitant on the steps, and I offered her my arm to supplement her stick. They're a bit steep, I said. A lot of people have problems. We should get a ramp, I addressed Ned, who was standing a few metres away. He and Mimi said nothing and all three of us shuffled to the main doors like a minor branch of a Trappist order.